yesterday when we parted i had told you that today we will be discussing salman rushdi and his novel midnight children which has been prescribed for your study i had asked you to do some basic background reading if you get time i had also asked you to go through the movie if you feel like the adaptation i had cautioned you that movie is an adaptation and not an absolute original retelling of the novel uh so before we begin today's session let me address a few questions that often surfaces the moment we discuss salman rushdie and most probably midnight children what rushdie when he was issued a fatwa by the religious fundamentalists for writing a so called blasphemic work b l a s p h e m i c blasphemic or blasphemy means something against religion outrightly uh, provocative against the religion right uh, i again i can give you a simple example again i'm teaching theory because there are certain things that i miss out just like i told you about symbolic violence so blasphemy what is blasphemy uh, there is this malayalam movie where um, uh, being a pujari but i think it's bharat gobi if i uh, correct me if i'm wrong bharat gobi being a pujari as the movie reaches the climax stamps the goddess's idol and spits in its face this is a straightforward example of blasphemy so those who accuse rushdi of being blasphemous those who accuse rushdi of being uh um, you know someone who is to be uh, condemned and those who issue fatwa against rushdi did so on the basis of a work called satanic verses you may all have heard about this work but i can bet you one thing for sure i can bet you that none of these fundamentalists would have read satanic verses in full for that sake any of rushdie's work in full because rushdie is one of the finest writers writing in english from india or we would call him diasporic because he is in exile so one of the best diasporic indian english writers that you would ever come across his language is so fine and complicated that a normal reader cannot complete reading rushdie's novels in that pretext i bet that none of these fundamentalists who issued a fatwa against rushdie would have read satanic verses it would have been more out of the hearsay or maybe publication of a couple of pages from here and there where there could be some outright references against the god then this is something that you need to be aware of i'm not saying all this because of uh, my urge to bring rushdie's personal political life into the classroom but also because you ought to be aware of how to approach rushdie if you remember the video that i played before starting my lecture today was why should we read midnight children by sud glepsi why should we read midnight children or for that sake why should we read salman rushdie as learners of literature why should we read salman rushdie where does he stand how where can we locate rushdie how appreciable is rushdie i bet as learners of literature despite being post graduate learners of literature you will find rushdie to be so complicated so complicated in the sense that Uh, his language is highly complex and you may find it really difficult to study or a hard nut to crack a lecture from me or two would not save you from that uh, difficulty i can only give you some parts or i can give you a few points but then at the end of the day when you go back to the drawing board you will find rushdie to be really 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 uh, problematic so the first question that surfaces is why should we read rushdie and why should we read midnight children and time and again and time and again and time and again 
when I speak to the to the learners, I tell them, read Rushdi, because primary reason as students of literature, we all like fancy fantasy uh, surprises. Rushdi has something called magic realism in most of his works. That will delight you. That will excite you. That will pump your blood out of it. That will that will astonish you. That apart, Rushdie brings forth scathing attack on these political vendettas, religious vendettas, and so on and so forth. And in doing it, more often than not, he brings in uh, uh, an element called historical metafiction. And that's another critical term that's pretty central to the discussions. You may go back to the glossary and have a look at these words if you want. Metafiction and historical metafiction. All right, so he intertwines or he blends history with narration or facts with fiction and uh, he complicates the narratology. It applies to Midnight Children as well. I'll come to Midnight Children just a little while later. But then he blends, Rushdi blends history with fiction and uh, he blends facts with fiction and he tries to bring in narratives which are relatably unrelatable or reliably unreliable i'm sure i'm confusing you further right we often have this belief when we read fiction that narrators are to be believed but then rushdi hanging in the postmodern lines, tries to remind us that narrators are not to be believed. So where were I? Yeah, so uh, Rushdie, clinging in the postmodern balance, tries to remind us that in the postmodern era, narrators are not to be relied upon. Narrators can be biased. They can lie. And sometimes they can undesirably lie. It's not that they purportedly lie. Because as a narrator, when I try to narrate from my memory, memory is always fragmented. It is not linear, it is not concrete. So when I rely on my memory and I try to narrate something, facts could get distorted. I could get a couple of things wrong here and there. And Rushdi is adamant that we should exercise the reader's diligence to validate whatever happens over there. And sometimes he just amazes us with the magic realistic elements. So uh, we should read Rushdie, for that sake, his novels, for the precise reason that one, he presents magic realism, two, his works are metafictions or historic metafictions, which blends facts and fantasies. <laughs> and uh, thirdly, for the attacks that he has, in political and uh, religious terms. So these facts should propel us as reader, as, as learners of literature to read Rushdie. So let me get started with, well, this is a key term that I have 30 minutes after every session. Let us get started. So let's get started with Rushdie. And as we get started with Rushdie, let me make things easier for you. Let me get started with something that you would be familiar with. What do we mean by magic realism? I'm sorry, I got the spelling wrong. So magic realism. Or what do you know about magic realism? Feel free to unmute yourself and share your feelings about magic realism with me. Anybody? I'm sure you would have learned about the concept during your bachelors, your undergrad days, and you may be familiar with the concept of magic realism. If not related to Rushdi, you would have heard it from someone else. Sir, I have actually watched the movie Midnight's Children in YouTube. And right. uh, what I understood uh, magic may, realism... May, may, is... may, I ask you, may I ask your name, please? I'm so sorry. It no, says it's Shivangi. Shivangi. Sorry? It's, it's Shivangi. 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 Okay, go on Shivangi. Okay, so sir, I watched that movie, and uh, if we dissect these terms, magic and realism, it means 
intersecting magic and reality like we see that the children are having a, in the, they may they are hallucinating or they can actually see the other children who are given with that gift at the midnight time so i think the magic realism is when we mix up magic with realism so that gives us an element of magic realism where we can also find a uh, reality and we can also find some element of uh, magic in it so that is magic realism all right that that's quite profound thank you thank you shivangi ji that's a good observation would somebody like to add to it are you familiar with any instances or works related to magic realism apart from midnight children that any instances of magic realism or any other writers exponents so of magic sir can dreams be called as magic realism no dreams are more of abstract manifestations of our mind and uh, it it has a lot to do with psychoanalysis and sigmund freud uh, it is not magic realism but maybe a writing on a dream like occurrence which is not real but seemingly superficial can sometimes be converted into a magic realistic uh, play thank you sir okay. but the precise question i'm asking at this point of time is are you guys familiar with any other writers or works that deals with magic realism or any instance all right doesn't matter doesn't matter let's not waste time on that silences uh talking about magic realism much before rushdi there were quite a lot of writers who practiced or who exercised magic realism one master craftsman of that genre is gabriel garcia marquez another latin american writer gabriel garcia marquez who wrote works like uh, on the times of cholera or uh, uh, 100 years of solitude he uh, was called the master of magic realism he toyed with magic realism a classic example is in uh, 100 years of solitude uh, in that book there is the central i think it's in 100 years of solitude or i'm not sure if it's in the the other one so in in, in his book there happens that there is a central protagonist and her name is uruzuela uruzuela is right there from the beginning she is part of the narratology and somewhere in the middle of the book uruzuela goes to drain her clothes to put it in the you know the thing that we have for draining the clothes in malayalam we call that aya yeah aya il thuni idan vendi thuni onakkan vendi uruzuela povunu so aya il thuni idan vendi uruzuela povunu and uh, what happens is uruzuela vanishes into thin air she just vanishes into thin air and thereafter in that novel there is no references whatsoever to uruzwell mind you in a traditional sense when a character who is central who has been part of the novel for a long time disappears into thin air yeah so she disappeared into thin air and the author doesn't give any explanations to it generally in a normal narrative the if a central character disappears midway the author would be giving some justifications or some substantiations or there would be references at some point of the uh, novel but here she drops out midway and there is no explanation given whatsoever about her uh, disappearance so there are quite a lot of writers including gabriel marcia Mar uh, sorry gabriel garcia marquez who were exponents of uh, magic realism but at a later point of time writers started to use this as a tool that deemed a political purpose so magic magical realism was adapted also to suggest something inadvertently political one such amazing writer that i would like to introduce to you as a small digression is gunter grass gunter grass in his novel tin drum the tin drum introduces a character the principal protagonist whose name is oscar nazaret So Oscar Mazzaret is born with a unique talent just like you would find in midnight children where different children have different attributes Oscar Mazzaret is born with different uh, with, with a unique talent rather a bane than a boon the moment he opens his mouth the glass walls would crack the moment he opens his mouth the glass wall would crack 
let me show you a small example. It won't take much long. It's barely 30 seconds long. You can go back to this later if and when you want it. This is from the trailer of that movie. That's been adapted into a movie as well. Let me just show you this. All right, so that's how Oscar opening his mouth results in breaking of glass doors and glass walls and windows. And uh, this is another instance of magic realism. We can yell or we can speak the way Oscar does, but then the walls does not break. But you know, that's where the blending of real with the magical or the superficial happens. So uh, it is in this case, Gontagras uses it as a resistance to fascism, especially of the Italian and German Nazi fascist forces. And uh, you can find the movie in YouTube if you want to. Tin Drum Novels Adaptation is available in YouTube if you want to have a look at the movie. That's an amazing uh, story. If you haven't read, I would always recommend you to read the Tin Drum. Coming to Rushdie. Rushdie was so fascinated by the way Gunter Grass employed magic realism in a political manner. So Rushdie started his career with a novel called Grimus or Grimus, whichever you want to pronounce it, G-R-I-M-U-S. It wasn't a success. It was a flop, critically not well received. He was actually um, you know, abused by critics all over. But then he gained his role through Midnight Children. Another prominent novel was Shame, S-H-A-M-E. So talking about magic realism, I'll come back to Midnight Children very shortly. And most of you may be familiar with the magic realistic elements in Midnight Children. But let me talk to you about this particular masterpiece. If uh, Midnight Children is about the partition of India and Indian independence and the story of India, Shame is a novel of a novel about Pakistan, the story of Pakistan, and it has as its as its protagonist a Pakistani hero whose name is Omar Khayyam. Omar Khayyam, and as the novel opens, the chapter, the first chapter, is about the birth of Omar Khayyam. First chapter describes in detail the birth of Omar Khayyam. The protagonist of the novel shame so what happens in salman rushdie's the shame is in the first chapter the first chapter describes the birth of the protagonist omar khayyam you know how omar khayyam was born as the novel begins we are told that there are three muslim sisters i always keep forgetting their names just for the sake of convenience let me say uh, Chunni, Munni and Dini, for instance. So there are three Muslim sisters, Chunni, Munni and Dini. And uh, one fine morning, they all conceive, they all get pregnant. And as months pass by, they bell their bellies enlarge slowly, like it happens. Pregnant women, they have uh, their stomach enlargement up until they deliver the baby. So let's say, Five months after, all three have stomach bumps. And let's say nine months and nine days later, all these three sisters together give birth to a single child who is the protagonist of our novel, that is Omar Khayyam. You got astonished, didn't you? That's exactly what magic realism is all about. Three sisters, three Muslim sisters, get conceived in a single day and nine months later, they give birth to a single child who is Omar Khayyam, the protagonist from Pakistan, who is the hero of this novel, Shame. This is how Rushdie entices you to read him. Or this is how interesting it gets to read Rushdie. I would recommend you to read this if you have patience. And I would like to remind you that he may not be an easy nut to crack. You may not feel the name is Shame, Preeti Agarwalji, Shame. We are discussing Midnight Children, but then I'm giving references on um, magic realism. So Shame is a novel by Salman Rushdie. 
then I also was referring to Tin Drum by Gunter Grass. I also made references to Gabriel Garcia Marcus. Again, another work that may interest you, which is not a novel though, is a short story collection by Salman Rushdie. It's available in Flipkart, just in case you want to buy one. It's a bit costly. The small book costs 500 Indian rupees, 499 to be precise. This book is titled East, West. East, West. And uh, this is a short story collection. It, it, it includes almost uh, nine short stories. But there are two which I would like to speak about at this point of time. One short story may be of interest to you if you read or if you learn MEG2, British, no, uh, sorry, British drama. There is a play called Hamlet by William Shakespeare in MEG2. So if and when you read MEG2 and you read the story of Hamlet, there is a later retelling of Hamlet by Rushdie in this book. And the story is titled Yorick. Y-O-R-I-C-K, Yorick. Just in case you have read that play before, you would realize that Yorick is a character who is not part of that play, but is referred to in a grave digger scene. Hamlet looks at a skull in a grave digger's place, in a cemetery, and he wonders whose skull this is. And the grave diggers say that this is Yorick's, and Hamlet nostalgically remembers that he was the clown at his palace who had taken him during his baby days. So Yorick is a retelling of Hamlet's story which exposes the clandestine relationship between Gertrude and Claudius. It is a compelling read. But then there are two more stories that I would like you to be aware of. One is the prophet's hair. Needless to say you would understand that the tale would be blasphemic, would be anti-Islamic in terms of the summaries. So the prophet's hair is one story uh, that might interest you. The, the other one is the free radio. The free radio, which is the second in this anthology, is a sarcastic take on Srimati Indira Gandhi's emergency politics. So the free radio is another story that I would request you to go through if and when you get time. It is one of the best satirical pieces that you would ever come across. What was popularly called back then as Nasbandi the compulsory or the forceful catastration uh, is something that was found objectionable by many and the people rallied against Srimati Indira Gandhi and uh, uh, Rushdie has this anti-Indian National Congress or anti-Nehru, anti-Indira uh, Gandhi politics which is quite evident in his novels and it can be seen in Midnight Children but then again I'm giving you cross references and uh, the free radio is one of those cross reference that I would recommend you to have a look at if time permits you and <clears throat> if you feel like reading. I know there are a lot of people who don't like to read. So even if you like to read, that's where we began today's session. To read Rushdie is a tedious task. I just mentioned that satanic verses would not have been read by any of the fundamentalists because it is almost 700 plus pages long. Same as the case with Midnight Children. It is conveniently divided into three parts or three books. And to read Midnight Children entirely is not humanly possible. As a postgraduate learner, I really struggled to learn Rushdi. I tried desperately to read Midnight Children because I had a lot of inspiring teachers in Maharaja's College of Maklam. There were people like Dr. Vergis Abraham who used to teach us Midnight Children in such a way that we'll feel fascinated to go back and have a look at that book. But then the moment we start reading, we'll find Rushdie's diction problematic. Once again, let me give you an example, not from Midnight Children, but from Shane. There may be a few of you, not all of you, but a few of you who may find my ways a little bit incomprehensible. Because I speak about these digressions and cross references. And uh, in that attempt, I don't speak much about the core text. But the reason, the justification that I have for that is core text to you log would go through with the blocks or Google or summary. These are things that you that won't reach you unless I introduce them to you. 
so i have a moral obligation to familiarize you with further references as well it's not only talking about the core text and also core text are plenty in mg7 right how many short stories do you have how many poems do you have 20 plus in five days can anybody humanly complete those 20 poems then add to it equivalent number of short stories and three to four novels and Mahesh Dattani Stara. It's humanly impossible to cover all those portions, even if you give me an entire year. So what I'm trying to do is fill in certain gaps. And if you attend my classes, when you go back to the text, you'll find learning really exciting. That's my attempt. So I'll give you one example from Shea. The first chapter that I spoke about, the way Rushdi ends it would remind you of Shashi Tharoor's speeches. There is one thing common to Shashi Tharoor's speeches and Salman Rushdie's writing. You can't listen to or read to them without having a dictionary with you. <laughs> so this is how Rushdie ends. Having signaled the birth of Amar Khayyam, before moving on to the second chapter from where the actions of Amar Khayyam would begin, Rushdie ends the first chapter this way. Dizzy, D I Z Z Y, dizzy, peripheral, inverted, infatuated, insomniac, stargazing, fat. What manner of a hero is this? Just one more repetition. Dizzy, peripheral, inverted, infatuated, insomniac, stargazing, fat. What manner of hero is this? It's a prelude which says, you're going to come across all these attributed features of a protagonist in the upcoming chapters. But look at the vocabulary that he's using. Dizzy, peripheral, inverted, infatuated, insomniac, stargazing, fat. We need a dictionary. So that's how complicated is reading Rushdie. I mean, reading Rushdie is. So coming to Midnight Children, let me just quickly run through midnight children because i also have to deal with annotations how to write annotations something that we left yesterday and i also have to speak briefly about the choice of your other subjects in the second year because you had asked me yesterday so i'll come to all that maybe in another 15 to 20 minutes so that's okay. all that i'm going to deal with midnight children very quickly let's rush through that note so what is midnight children all about to, to just sum it up, you would have already seen that in that video by Ishud Gillespie. At the stroke of midnight of 15th, 15th August 1947, when India gained independence, 101 children were born into this nation. Based on the proximity of their time of birth, they had certain superpowers and the quality of the superpowers were more or less based on the proximity to the midnight based on their time of birth. Somebody who was born exactly at the stroke of 12 had higher superpowers when compared to somebody who was born at 11.45 and to someone who was born at 11.30. So this sort of a situation, a fairy tale like situation, is the starting point of the known. Again, you should remember at this point of time that way back in 1981, when this novel was written, telecommunications network was not established. Today we have video call conferencing and we can connect to people globally. But way back in 1981, it was even unimagined. And that's where Rushdi prophetically establishes these conventions. So back then, you could call it magic realism, where Salim Sinai is able to, or all the midnight children are able to uh, interact with each other through brain mapping. But come to 2023, you would not call it magic realism, but you would call it teleconferencing or video conferencing. <clears throat> Nonetheless, Nonetheless, let me talk to you about Midnight's Children in a, in a jiffy. Midnight's Children tracks the story of Salim Sinai, the protagonist of the novel. And his journey 
is equally the journey of india post indian independence metaphorically midnight of august 15 marked the birth of a new baby that is independent india so the growth of salim is equivalent to or is relatable to the development of the nation the story begins at the stroke of midnight of indian independence and quite a lot of historical events are included in the novel including the indo park indo park war indo bangladeshi scenario the bangladesh civil war and it culminates in the um, partition uh, so not partition i'm sorry the internal emergency uh, by uh, shrimati indira gandhi like i've already told you uh, rushdi was highly critical of shrimati indira gandhi and jawaharlal nehru and the politics put forward by the indian national congress through these two people so you could see him to be highly critical and mincing no words to criticize these people when it comes to rushdi you must also be aware of two terms post colonial and post modern where should we place him is a tricky thing because rushdi doesn't give hold at all like some fish that escapes through our hands rushdi doesn't give a firm hold a firm footing on neither of this but yet he is both he could be deemed a diasporic post colonial writer or he could also be called a post modernist writer it is a feature of post modernism where metafiction or historiographic metafiction comes into fore so he uses history to suit his character's progress but at the same time he plays with and he thwarts history and he falsifies history that's where logic would seem incomprehensible to you in the novel as the novel opens as i already told you 101 children are born at the stroke of midnight haven't we heard the story somewhere before yes this reminds us immediately of quite a lot of other fairy tales that we would have come across or grown across that includes the panchatantra tales the arabian nights and quite a lot of other stories so rushdi deliberately relies on these premises to set up a story that is entirely different from that narratives that we have heard of a rather serious narrative blended with facts and fiction so rushdi speaks about salim sanai who aspires to be a writer and then we also know we should also note that salim sanai is actually a hindu but switched at birth by the nurse back then a popular concept in the bollywood movies so a hindu born guy is switched into a muslim family and a muslim born guy is switched into a hindu family and the muslim who is switched into the hindu family is the antagonist of salim his name is shiva and salim who was born into the hindu family who would have supposedly been called shiva is named as salim and we have his love interest padma and we can see that padma is illiterate so salim reads his stories to padma because she is a lady interest and uh, he has to explain certain things to padma because his writings are scholarly he aspires to be a classic writer and his struggles are intertwined with the progress or the lack of progress of the nation in narrating this progress of salim and india rushdi blends quite a lot of phantasmagoric elements in the story it is a tale within a tale within a tale within a tale again a feature of panjadandra or again a feature of arabian nights salim moves from one story to the other to the other to the other and in the novel salman rushdi blends magical realism to its supreme effect we can say that midnight children is one of the masterpieces of magic realism first of all who are these 1001 children what are their capabilities they have different capabilities one baby is born with a tail i'm talking about a human child born with a tail there is another character who can 
walk through a mirror in Japan and walk out of a mirror in Delhi or vice versa walk through a mirror in New Delhi and walk out of a mirror in Japan well that technology is still to be implemented we still have to rely on flights but then there is another character a girl a lady who can with a single glance entice any man to fall for her then some of you would say isme kaun si badi baat hai we can also do that right just a glance and a guy would fall for you possible but that's not the magic realism there the same girl can at her wish with another glance make this guy commit suicide i repeat with a single glance the girl can charm any guy entice any guy and make him fall for her and with another glance of rejection she could make that guy commit suicide so there are quite a lot of such fantastic characters in that novel uh among that uh, another character is padma padma has this uh, what do you call this thing where she can hide anybody in her um, what do you call what do you call it the basket yes a basket yeah. in which she can hide or make anybody invisible and weightless so sometimes padma uh, makes salim escape in her basket so padma has that superpower salim is perhaps salim and shiva are perhaps the most powerful people among the lot and salim can as i have already remarked uh, invite all these midnight children into a teleconference and he could communicate with them he could discuss with them he could urge them to do certain things he could command them so that's the magical superpower among many others that salim sanai possessed so we come across quite a lot of phantasmagoric elements blended in rushdi in uh, midnight children and that is something that you should be aware of as you try to read the novel and despite being a teacher of literature despite someone who would have to urge you to read literature uh i can bet that most of you may not be able to read the novel and in case of uh, midnight children it is better to uh, it's better to refer to your blocks it is better to refer to summaries it is better to refer to critical works on rushdi and that would help you appear for your exams better just maybe you take another 5 years to read rushdi for a preliminary reading i'm not even saying for a critical reading because rushdi is really a hard nut to crack so another thing that needs to be uh, taken care of is the historicity as i've already told you uh, that takes place in the novel so it has uh, a lot of uh, references to the historical events uh, in the country because salim's growth is also the growth of a nation so uh, there is this reference to indo pak war indian independence or indira gandhi impressing her political opponents in suspending the democratic rights of the poor people during the emergency and so on and so forth so we come across all these uh, historical things in the novel and more often than not it is thwarted for instance while blending the fantasy and uh, evocating the fairy tales and all <laughs> rushdi speaks about how valmiki wrote mahabharata he he equates salim sinai's troubles of becoming a writer to that of valmiki's struggles to write ramayana whereas valmiki is not the person who actually wrote ramayana it was by uh, vedavyasa valmiki wrote ramayana but then there were a lot of critics who rallied against rushdi but then rushdi had actually deliberately twisted such occasion there are quite a lot of examples where rushdi deliberately this um, plays with this historical facts and he tries to thwart them that is a postmodern way of reminding the readers of reader responsibility if and when you are learning mag5 literary criticism and theory whenever you come across roland barth that of the other or michel foucault who is an author you would come across the same dilemma where the author in a postmodern world or in a post uh structuralist world is a dead entity and the reader is privileged with uh, his birth and with his powers to interpret the text in the way he or she wishes to so uh, rushdi wants the reader to exercise that thing and he is very particular that we 
double check the facts told by the narrator and you want to prove that the narrator is unreliable the narrator of a tale should not be depended upon and he is totally unreliable in terms of uh, his uh, authenticity he could lie or he could thwart facts he could be biased or he could by sheer lack of memory uh, misinterpret something to be something else so that's something that you need to be aware of while reading uh, Rushdie's novel. Again, before we quickly move on to the next part, uh, let me also briefly uh, talk about, um, just, a, just give me a second. Um, yeah, I've, talk, I, I've, I've spoken to you about the unreliability of the narrator, the structure, um, the lack, yeah, the, the plot also lacks coherence, as I told you. It is one story within the other, and there is no proper beginning, middle, or the end. Uh, in the beginning part, we would feel like this is the story, this is almost another Bildung's Roman, but then the story has its own twists and turns, and it does not follow any particular structure per se. In terms of techniques, it's highly emblematic of uh, Marquez's 100 Years of Solitude, but then uh, Rashdi entirely dismisses that claim and he says that he came across Marquez only after that. So, yeah, he, he says he was more inspired by the way Gunter Grass used magic realism for his political uh, purposes. And I also made allusions to these fairy tales, Panjatantra, Kadasarit Sagara, Arabian Nights, or the other epics that we have grown up as children is highly relied upon by Rushdie to build up the novel. And let me again remind you that the movie is an entirely different thing. The movie barely does say 20% justice to the novel. The novel has not been converted effectively into a cinematic form. It is literally impossible. Maybe in the post-COVID world, if you think about a web series on Midnight Children, I would say it would still make sense. But as a novel, I'm not so sure. I mean, as a, as a movie, I'm not sure it, it, it reaches any of those uh, intended purposes. I have also referred to this uh, Valmiki thing. And uh, did I miss something else? Let me just scroll through these texts. Uh, yeah, I think I have almost rushed through the core aspects, the summary or the internal details are for you to read. The language is something I missed out, but then I'll come back to it if and when I get time in the next schedule, if we have a next schedule, uh, I'll discuss Kantapura and I'll discuss Rushdie's language with you because that's also something significant, but we'll do that in our next session, if we are blessed with the next session, that is. And uh, yep. So that's a preliminary discussion. I could, I cannot, due to the limit of time, get through a major character analysis or much more detailed analysis of these things. Now, very quickly, let me shift to uh, a couple of more useful things for you, especially in terms of your exams and your marks. Annotations. Well, I had asked all of you to attempt an annotation and mail it to me by today afternoon. I only got one or two and uh, then I thought maybe you are taking time and I gave, uh, I, I texted you at four o'clock urging you to send me your annotations. But then, unfortunately, despite that, I only got maybe one or two more. And uh, yeah, I'm just taking it to have a look at it, nothing else. And uh, let me initiate a discussion on how to write good annotations. All right. So let me just very quickly discuss how to write annotations to you. Already, I have told you that you never begin an annotation by saying these lines or the above lines are taken from this particular form. You never begin an annotation like that. Despite that, I had received a couple of annotations, attempts with the statement these lines are taken from the poem 
dash by Jayanda Mahapatra. So now let me talk to you about how to write annotations. So how to write annotations. So talking about annotations, it has to be divided into three parts. An introductory paragraph, which should be three to four to maximum five sentences long. Three would be ideal, but four or five if the situation demands. Then there should be a core paragraph. I call that a core paragraph, which would be detailing the lines given, or that is actually the proper annotation. And then there should be a concluding paragraph, and conclusion should be analog um, analogy references comments styles historical facts etc now let me detail this to you i have put that in the chat box just in case you want to have a look at that let me spend 10 to 15 minutes detailing to you about this particular scenario so the moment you speak about writing an annotation, that should consist three paragraphs. I've already told you the space that you can take for a para for an annotation is, if this is an A4 site paper, three fourth of it, or maximum a page, and maybe a quarter or a half, not more than that. So the moment because it only has five marks, so for five marks, how long would you write? So the moment you write an annotation, it should have three parts, introduction, body, and conclusion. So what should the introduction be? More often than not, people begin by saying, these lines are from dash, 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 or the above lines are from in a poem. And that's not the way you should begin a poem, begin an annotation. Annotation should employ indirect speech into use. So you could rather begin in that sense without you know being uh, emotional you could begin rather carelessly by stating hunger is a poem by jayanta mahapatra jayanta mahapatra was the first indian writer to win sahitya academy award was the first to win sahitya academy academy award uh, by writing indian english or in by writing in english and then in a line, I mean, in a sentence or maximum two, you could sum up what happens in that particular poem. Hunger is a poem about the conflict between lust and hunger, or two kinds of lust, uh, poverty and physical. This includes your first paragraph. Let me repeat once again. Hunger is a poem by Jayanta Mahapatra. Or it could be an introduction is a poem by Kamala Das. Or poet lover bird watcher is a poem by uh, Mr. Mesikil. No, is it the other guy? Okay, whoever it is. Okay, so or for instance, uh, um, Our Kashorina Tree is a poem by Toru Dutt. So that's your first statement. You identify where these lines are taken from. Because you have six to eight annotations. You have to write four of them. So you identify, first of all, from which piece this is taken. In identifying that, don't say these lines are from this poem by this poem, but rather say this particular poem is written by this particular person. Our Kashorina tree is by Toru Dutt, or um, Hunger is a poem by um, this particular fellow. Um, or let's say, um, yeah, Hunger is a poem by Jayanta Mahapatra. Uh, and then you go on to say about that particular person in a single line. You could say, uh, if you are, say for instance, if you are talking about R. Partha Sarathi, you have three poems prescribed by uh, R. Partha Sarathi. So if, say for instance, you are talking about his poem Homecoming, so you could say uh, Homecoming is a poem by R. Partha Sarathi. 
our Partha Sarathi uh, is one of those, uh, is one among the three uh, poets uh, from India who paved way or who laid foundations on which Indian poetry was built upon, including A.K. Ramanujan and Jayanta Mahapatra. And then you speak about Homecoming is a poem about Dash. This is how your first paragraph should be composed of. Let's say if it's about an introduction, an introduction is a poem by Kamala Das. Kamala Das is one of the most notable confessional poets or rather women poets in India, whichever way you want to phrase it. And then you speak about an introduction is one of the noted poems by Kamala Das, which talks about her dilemmas or her miseries as an Indian woman writing in English and also as a girl, as a woman who was married off at a young age. This forms your first paragraph. Here you have stated which poem, which author. You have written about the author in a sentence or two. And you have also summed up the poem in a line or two. That's done. The last line of that poem should be the I mean, that will be ideal. This could be the last line. But if you have that sort of a photographic memory, you can end that statement, that, that paragraph by stating in which stanza, which line this particular line occurs. Let's say in the case of yesterday, uh, in the second stanza of the poem Hunger, Jainta Mahapatra says, uh, widowed white clad women waited outside the temple faithfully. You could recreate those lines if you want. Your second paragraph, needless to say, is an elaboration of that idea that has been conveyed. The idea that has been conveyed. For instance, if you, uh, you, you will be, you will be, you'll have to uh, summarize what is being said in those lines. Let me just give you a demonstrative example because otherwise I think maybe you'll find this explanation boring. Are you able to follow me? Whatever I've said so far, is that comprehensible to you? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. So let me just share the screen. Take the example from what we taught yesterday so that it's relatable to you. So let me just share my screen and show you hunger. Not the other one though. Not Don at Puri. I messed up a little bit. So, okay. So, if these three lines are asked, the fisherman said, will you have her carelessly, trailing his nets and his nerves, as though his words sanctified the purpose with which he faced himself. So, if these three lines are asked for annotation, your introduction would be, as I've already told you, hunger is a poem by Jayanta Mahapatra. If there's a collection, you can add that as well. This, uh, an introduction, for instance, is from the collection of poems, Summer in Calcutta. So you could add that if you want, that's okay. Then you speak about the author, and then you say, um, the poet opens the poem. As the poet uh, begins the poem, we could see that the narrator is with a fisherman, and the fisherman offers, uh, the fisherman is in misery or in poverty, and uh, he offers his daughter to the uh, narrator. And uh, then you quote these lines and then you move on to the second paragraph where you summarize these lines. So what would be the ideal summary? In that opening stanza, the fisherman tells the narrator. So you're putting it into reported speech. The fisherman said becomes into the reported speech. So you say the fisherman tells the narrator or asks the narrator whether he would have his daughter. He appears to be in a careless manner, or he pretends to be careless or unbothered, uh, but then he is struggling to control both his nerves and his nets. And uh, he blindly believed that his words would uh, sanctify the purpose, that is the poverty or the misery that he is in. He has to feed a lot of stomachs. And then uh, you could say that, mind you, only these three lines are given. So you could say that, uh, you could quote the next two lines if you remember it, and you could add that uh, prior to this, the, the, the narrator was uh, standing with a heavy back, with flesh on his, on his back, uh, the flesh of the guilt or the guilt of the sin that he's gonna commit. And uh, after the fisherman said this, 
he could despite the fisherman trying to be unemotional uh, the narrator could see that the fisherman wanted him to oblige the fisherman's eyes were so so uh, desperate uh, urging this man to accept the offer if required if you think this is not enough you could also add a couple of lines on what happens later so that would be a summary of the lines given that is the proper annotation so what is the third paragraph that is a crucial paragraph after the first paragraph where you have identified the third paragraph is what is going to fetch you marks the third paragraph is your conclusion your conclusion would be your references or your inferences let me use another word there your inferences about those lines given there let me take a situation out of the context i'm not talking about indian english poetry right now let me say uh, in mg1 you have annotation so let's say if you are dealing with <clears throat> a poem by william shakespeare or a poem by alexander pope or john dryden or let's say you uh, have for annotation a poem by um, what is his name john dunn john dunn who is known for metaphysical poetry so then in the last paragraph you are expected to bring out the salient features of their writing style for instance shakespeare is known for blank verse v e r s e or alexander pope and john dryden are known for neo classical writings their writings were mostly mock epics so there was an epic structure and a para, an iambic uh, shakespeare used iambic pentameter similarly uh, dryden and pope wrote in another i i i the heroic couplet form yeah they used heroic couplet form uh, dryden invented it and uh, alexander pope perfected it or when we speak about john dunn or richard crasho or andrew marvel they were all metaphysical poets and they had metaphysical conceits in their poetry so you have to refer or you have to infer on their writing styles you may also comment on the structure of poetry i did that yesterday while teaching hunger and the other one donat puri so in hunger you can see that it is divided into four stanzas of five lines each maybe you can speak about the rhyme scheme if you are learning shakespeare's sonnet for instance you could speak about the abba sonnet rhyme scheme in his sonnets so you could speak about that or you could write about cross references for instance that could be between the writer or between his fellow writers for instance you can speak about how jayanta mahapatra brings in poverty and hunger in his other poems or you could speak about how some other writers have also brought similar circumstances let me give you an example for instance when say for instance these three lines are asked for um uh, your annotation on references to the girl opening her legs wide i got reminded of sadhu tasan mantos kol do story i had shared it with you yesterday so maybe you could refer that um immoral uh, not immoral but in the women the issues of women trafficking and how poverty forces women to take to prostitution or the perils of war and partition are abound in literatures across the nation and one such instance uh, along the lines of uh, jayanta mahapatra can be seen with sarathas and manto where he dip, displays partitions horrors uh, horrors of partition in his work kol do where a young adolescent girl having been molested says call and uh, unbutton her pajamas when the doctor says open the window so maybe there is just an example you could you could uh, well the spelling of it's not mantu it's manto sadat hasan manto if you haven't read him you should definitely read him toba take sing dog of tithwal tanda ghost adava cold meat and then comes this cold do you you 
get it in what is called as short story, uh, complete short stories of Sarasana Sanmantra. There is an anthology. Okay. Or you could Google that. You will get it. So any other work for that sake, uh, Donat Puri, for instance, or um, there is this poem. I forgot the name of that poem. Uh, I think it's by Jayanta Mahapatra himself, where he speaks about uh, a village which is completely dry and poor. There is only misery and plague. I forgot the name of that poem. Uh, I always get its pronunciation wrong. The name of a city or a, or a village, perhaps. Mm, well, I, I, I'll, I'll give that reference later. I, I, I keep forgetting the name of that uh, poem. I mean, that, uh, that city. Kalahandi. Yeah, Kalahandi. K A L A H A N D I. I'm glad I remembered it. I think it was by him. Let me just check. My memory fails me. That's why I said that these narrators are quite unreliable. Or Rushdi says, Kalahandi. Poem. Isn't that the name of the poem? Shows me a district elsewhere. No, it's by Jagannath Prasad Das. I'm sorry, I said Jayanta Mahapatra. Kalahandi is a poem by Jagannath Prasad Das. And just in case you haven't read it, I would recommend you to have a look at it because you could easily compare it with several other poems described in this paper. All right. So that's a poem that I would like you to go through if you get time, if and when you get time. So in the last paragraph, as I told you, you could uh, make such ref cross references, intertextual references. You can refer to the same orders, different work where the same scenario uh, replicates, or you may refer to a different order and his uh, similarity in a theme. Or you could make a, a reference on the styles of the narrator, the author, uh, or you could, uh, uh, in certain cases, you could also speak about historical facts or the background of uh, background that necessitated the writing of the poem and so on and so forth. Or you could also comment on the poem. It could be your comment or it could be uh, a comment of a, a popular critic that you have come across. Maybe a, po a, a comment, uh, a critic says that this particular poem is uh, a classic, for instance. So you could quote that <clears throat> critic and say that this critic says so. One danger when I speak about this is that I have been told by a lot of learners uh, quite honestly that they end up creating a lot of non-existent critics. They would go and say that uh, PC Borwal uh, speaks highly about uh, Kegi and Daruwala and he says that Daruwala is one of the best writers in India. Or people say that um, uh, 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 one of the noted poets in 21st century and uh, a well-known uh, critic one Mr. Anand Krishnamurti uh, condemns the writing style of uh, Kamala Das. Whereas it's not about me, they're just giving a fictitious name. And they say that this particular person has such a take on uh, a particular person. So uh, be aware that those who are valuing the papers have been doing this for ages and they would easily get to know that you have cooked up a name and a comment. And one <clears throat> factual thing is that when you put a quote on record, let's say, for instance, if T.S. Eliot says that Hamlet lacks an objective correlator and hence it's an artistic failure, that's what he says. So then you have to put it in double quotes. But the moment you put it in double quotes, make sure that you have not missed a single letter or word in that. It should be the absolute verbatim. So if you are not a rote learner, that's if you can't learn things by heart, then don't attempt this. Instead, put it into reported speech. T.S. Eliot had infamously uh, critiqued William Shakespeare's Hamlet by saying that it lacked an objective correlator uh, and hence it is, he deemed it to be an artistic failure. It's totally fine. There is a popular misconception that you will get marks only if you quote these lines or if you quote the uh, exact words in double quotes, that's not true. Yes, that may create an impression or two that you have remembered. But apart from that, even if you put it in reported speech, I would say that will be fair enough. There is no need to worry about it. All right. So that sums up our discussions on annotation. 
before leaving the floor open for the discussions i have the responsibility to touch one more aspect uh, allow me to do that before i leave the floor open and uh, you may by now know what that is uh, my responsibility is to talk to you about the uh, optional courses that you can choose uh, you had asked me about that in the last class so here is the um, syllabus that was shared to me by some of you and i understand that this is how they have distorted the structure of the syllabus i hope my screen is visible to all of you let me just yes, try to do this for you let me try to deconstruct this for you so currently you have MEG5, which is compulsory in the first year. And then you have to choose among this, probably most of you have chosen uh, writings from India, Indian English literature, English studies in India, and contemporary Indian literatures and English translation. So I would not waste my time commenting on those selections, but rather I would wish you the best. Now, let me talk to you about your, your choices in the second year from what I can see from the syllabus, unlike the first year, you have a privilege to choose between the core papers. You have two core papers in the second year. And to be very honest, I am not aware of what the rationale behind the second core paper. Comparative literature to me gets along with this module. Indian English literature, English studies in India, contemporary Indian literature, English translation, or for that sake, with the paper writings from margin. Though comparative literature is not about margins, but then it can still get along with there. So I'm not sure how it stands independently as a core paper, but then it is one of the raw fields when it comes to English literature. When it comes to theory, it is cultural studies. And when it comes to progression in literature, comparative literature, as well as translation, are two subjects which gives a scope for progress. Whereas all the other papers stands there, Indian English literature, American literature, British literature, the moment we read that, that's where we stop our learning. But comparative and translation are two papers which would give us further scope to explore ourselves. So in such a context, uh, I'm not sure how that stands independently, but I'll tell you the rationale between the choice of the two core papers. Aspects of language, is basically about the fundamental inclusions of language. I could say phonetics, linguistics, and glossary blended into a single paper. So if you are a rote learner, rote means the learner who can learn things by heart, then I would say aspects of language would be appealing to you. And another appealing fact that aspects of language has is it will only have short notes and essays, nothing else, because it's completely full of facts. For instance, how are uh, consonantal sounds produced? So you have to say there are this many types of consonant sounds. And when your tongue touches the upper, upper part of the teeth, then this particular sounds are pronounced. Or when your tongue touches the ovula or maybe the lower part of the lip, then this becomes the lip becomes rounded and this particular sounds are formed. So such narrations are factual. You can't go wrong. So you have to depend on your memory. So if you are good at that, uh, that is something that you could uh, refer or opt for. But otherwise, I would recommend you to choose comparative literature. Again, I would like to caution you on choosing comparative literature because it has annotations. So far, I don't know if it will change, but comparative literature paper for its final exams, the first section is annotation. So if you can't learn the poems by heart and if you can't write that better, then you would stand to lose marks. And mind you, that's a core paper. So that's something that you need to do. You should use the three structure method that I taught you in the first class. Go to the previous year question paper, go to the assignment question paper, go to the syllabus. If required, go to the PDF study materials and see if you are able to follow that. And then make a choice on which core paper you want for the second year. Talking about the optionals, I must say I'm baffled by the stupidity of the divisions with the optionals. Probably because I've, cho I've taught British literature uh, during all these five to six years in IGNU. I must say that it's really baffling. Because the first of the optional modules for me is a sure bet. If you give me this uh, optionals and ask me to take one, 
in a very canonical stereotypical traditional point of view of literature there is no point in having an ma without exploring british literature if you if you scan through the syllabuses of ma in india whether in universities central universities or in colleges or in regular uh, study if you look at any syllabi over the country of ma english you would see that they are 60% or 70% british so if you ignore that module if you intend to become a teacher of english in some college you are going to struggle terribly when you go for an interview or when you try to teach because you have you will have to teach all that you haven't learned you don't have exposure to british literature at all because you learn mg5 then you learn indian english literature and translation and then all of a sudden maybe you take uh, writings from the margins and you go for a job without any exposure to british or american literatures that sounds astonishingly stupid to me whoever has been instrumental behind this decision i i find that really stupid but then i would caution you from choosing the first module also because british drama and british novel are two papers that you would really love and relish learning you would love british novels because that's full of stories even if you read the summary two days before from wikipedia you can pass that paper british drama is also about stories sparing the fact that the first part has annotations drama won't be a hard nut to crack for you annotations would be difficult because plays are longer its length is you know it's it's lengthier so to difficult to to to, to remember those lines won't be that easy in comparison to a poem but further difficulty emerges with mg1 because mg1 contains only annotations you have quite a lot of annotations for mg1 and given the fact that you don't get proper classes full time if you are not able to crack there are quite a lot of learners who fail mg1 over the last 3 to 4 years because that's when the change came otherwise it had a lot of essays so from the moment annotations came into mg1 i know quite a lot of learners who keep writing supplementary exam for mg1 so think before you jump into module 1 but in terms of having a base in terms of having a proper understanding of literature i would always recommend british literature to you then among the choices given i would request again this is a suggestion don't take me seriously because eventually the decision is yours it is your battle you have to pass the exam you have to play by your strengths and you have to work on what is workable to you what appeals to me may not easily be appealing to you so don't go by by my words but i'm just putting certain perspectives to you so taking british literature apart if i have to choose a paper i would be confused only between two papers it's like kon barega kropadi that option elimination section so i have if you give me four options writing from india new literatures in english writing from the margin and american literature i closed i'll delete new literatures and american literature from my options i'll tell you why a little while later let me talk about the other two options writing from india and writing from the margins these two are two extremely useful modules in my particular opinion writings from india is handicapped because it doesn't have comparative literature but because comparative literature is already a core paper if you opt for comparative literature then writings from india is a good option because mg40 as i told you is equally progressive domain like mg15 contemporary indian literature in english translation would expose you to the various prospects of translation again it also has annotations but if you are ready for that those two papers along with comparative literature would equip you to you know functionally become performative after your pg you could seek careers in let's say you could do another ma in translation or gender studies or comparative literature or you could do an mphil in comparative literature <clears throat> if you are from kerala you have this sri shankara university of Kal uh, sanskrit in kalandi ssus ssus offers and i am fill not only in english literature but it also has an fill in comparative literature and it also has an mphil department in translation and gender studies 
So you could opt for any of this if you have it as a course of study. So that's something that you could do. But then be wary of the annotations. Look at the study materials and see if it is comprehensible to you and then take a choice. Talking about writings from the margins, I ordered to that paper. Generally, feature chronologically in the syllabus, it is not in the previous year question section of the RMS session. It is in a way an invisible paper in the syllabus. And more often than not, when you choose that paper, you may not have academic counselors who will be teaching that paper. I am also not eligible to teach that paper because we can only choose five to six papers among the lot. So in choosing that, I did miss out writings from the margin. Though that's a paper. So uh, I was talking to you about from the margins. Yes. So the special, the peculiarity. Okay, where did you hear? Like, uh, did I did you hear till Indian folk literatures or only about writing from the margins? Where did you lose? Till writing from the margins, sir. Only that much. Okay. So I was trying to tell you that uh, that paper is also good because uh, writing from the margin would expose you to the subaltern and Dalit problems faced in India, the caste. Uh, differences in India. MEG 14, as I already told you, is a functional paper. So that will also help you uh, to do to appreciate literature well. And Indian folk literature is one of the best papers that you could ask for because it, it would expose you to the oral culture and subcultures, to the uh, to the indigenous songs and the oral tradition as opposed to the written falsifying of histories and so on. So uh, one problem that you may face though when you choose that module is that you may not have academic counselors for those papers, most probably. Unlike let's say MEG 7, 10 and 14 or MEG 1, 2 and 3 or MEG 6, 11 and so on, uh, you may not have academic counselors for MEG uh, 13, 14, sorry 13 and 15. MEG 14 of course you'll have, but MEG 13 and 15, I'm not sure 16, you, don't, you may not have uh, academic sessions. That's one problem. But then if you want to appreciate Indian writings, then that's a good choice. Now, the reason why I didn't support new literatures in English and American literature is because I personally believe that uh, the only paper that's good in that is MEG 8. Take MEG 8 apart. MEG 9, 10 and 11 are trash. Being people, subjects of 21st century literature, we need not have an interest in 20th century Canadian literature. It's outdated, done and dusted. Canadian literature is candlelight literature. Same with Australian literature. And MEG 9 is similar to MEG 7 and MEG 6 because you have all the genres included. It is highly large and complex. You have prose, you have poetry, short story, novel, then you have drama, essays, you have everything in it. And then having taken that, what is the point in taking Australian novel? So I would call them trash. If that's a personal opinion, if you have a different opinion or if you want to read them and learn them, maybe if you want to settle down in Canada later, then go ahead. Not a problem. The problem with American literature, the paper is that, to be honest, British literature and American literature are the most sought after in the current era. So to ignore them has its risk. But then the problem is, the way this module has been divided. MEG 6, as I told you, already includes MEG 11, 17, and 18, though different texts. MEG 6, 6 already includes novel, drama, poetry, prose, short story, and so on and so forth. Then to again deal with American novel, drama, and poetry would sound rather absurdical to me. And again, when you choose American literature and have, let's say, aspects of fiction or comparative literature, and then choose literary theory and criticism, I would say your literature is incomplete because you haven't been exposed to British. You haven't been exposed to Indian English literature apart from in that module. So that would sound rather incomplete or partial. So that is a personal opinion. I would dissuade you from choosing uh, the last and the one before the last. So new literatures and American literature are two papers I would dissuade you from and uh, in my opinion, British literature is a traditional choice. If you can't write annotations in poetry, then do the, don't do that. In that case, your, your choice should be between writings from India and writings from the margins. Uh, writings from India, I think you have already chosen. So 
maybe I think you have to choose between British and writings from the margins. Again, that's for you to take. I would strongly recommend not to choose new literatures and American literatures. I've told you why. It doesn't mean this is a bad module. It has quite a lot of exciting plays and novels and poems, but then uh, it will be quite complex for you to learn it uh, from your uh, limitations offline. Uh, sorry, uh, of distant education. All right. Sorry in elaborating and in between the network errors. The time is 730, but don't worry. I know I had disconnected for a long while so we can have 10 to 15 minutes of discussion if you have any queries also because today is the last session on MEG 5 in this stretch. Dr. Prema has told me that they will arrange for another stretch, but I'm not sure for optional papers. Sometimes we don't get an extended session. It has to be approved by the director of the RC and more often than not, they may dismiss the uh, request because it's only uh, an optional paper and they have to give sessions of other papers as well. So uh, that can be that has to be foreseen as well. So yeah, the floor is open for questions. Nasiba Nasi asks about MEG 8. I think I already told you. Uh, I don't think you can choose only, only one from this. See, you can't choose between MEG 8, MEG 10 and MEG 7. If you choose MEG 8, you have to choose one, two between 9, 12 and 19. And I, I rate 9, 12 and 19 as substandard papers. And that's why Nasiba, I'm dissuading you from it. MEG 8, to be honest, is, a, is an amazing paper. But then the cluster, unfortunately, does, ton, does not get along. Yeah, let me also add one more thing, Rubiji, because you said this. Uh, if you choose margins, and if you don't choose margins, there are two perspectives out there. Let me just uh, underline that once more. If you choose margins, then it gets along with the choice that you had in the first year. So let's say if you go for an interview and the interviewer asks you, why did you choose this particular paper? You could say that I had done Indian literature in the first year and I was so into it that I was so inspired that I chose uh, margins from literature because it was an extension of what I learned in the first year. Or you could say that even though I was so inspired by the papers that I opted in the first year, I felt like I had to explore a bit more of British literature and that's why I opted for the uh, British literature component. So you could have justification both ways. So one problem of being an academic counselor at IGNO is that we only get this very limited sessions and uh, the moment we are into the second day, uh, we come across a lot of criticism from various quarters. There would be people who would be telling us that uh, that student remarked like this against you. That student says that you are not covering the portions properly. That student says that you are you are you are talking about various other digressive things than the story. And then uh, people at Igno understand me because they know that we only have this limited time and we have to initiate you into that literary mode. But then as distant learners, sometimes it's really difficult, especially over the online mode, to make you understand that uh, we are seasoned campaigners at this. And we would by no means risk you when we are following a certain methodology that is with best of your interest in mind, especially because these sessions are recorded. Let's say if you write a mail to the director saying that we happen to be in this particular person's class and his classes were not at all about the subject, then they can take it up and they can look at this video and maybe come back to me asking, yeah, this is right or this is wrong, right? So we are very well aware of this. And at least there have been times when we have been questioned by people because they were not able to follow us. But then at the end of the day, it, it is really so pleasing to hear from even let's say two or three people that, okay, we understood what you were trying to do to us. We were able to uh, have an idea of how to proceed in our career, or we got enlightened in certain ways, or we were able to understand the methodology. And uh, that's something that's so soothing and inspirational. Uh, again, this is not a personal reference, but then uh, on the second day, a colleague of mine had actually quite alarmingly called me up, uh, not second day, third day, it was yesterday, yeah, yesterday, uh, before my fourth class. A colleague of mine had texted me saying, uh, I'm part of a group in a college here, and uh, in that college, the students had initiated a discussion, and somebody who missed the class asked, uh, how's the classes? And somebody texted, oh, he took an introduction and the sunshine cat, and he just rushed through the sunshine cat. And he, she, she told me you should be cautious because the sessions are recorded and it could be used against you. And I told her, how is it possible? We have 21 poems and all that we can do is touch the tip of the iceberg. And when I look back, I personally believe that I touched sunshine cat as much as it required. 
let's say we can't give the same time to donut puri and hunger hunger is comparatively elaborate so i took 35 to 40 minutes donut puri is comparatively shorter so maybe 15 to 20 minutes so there could be misunderstandings i'm aware of that but then i'm really glad that you at least some of you are able to follow that and you uh thank you sir uh, sir any suggestion for those who are not having english in graduation um well i i was about, i was contemplating that when ruby ji said that she is from a science background generally when we have offline classes in rc coaching i spend my first two sessions on that so we don't have that much time but what i can tell you is a proper understanding of history of english literature is equally important as having an understanding of literature so there are two references that i would give you one there are quite a lot of books with the title history of english literature one by edward albert one by uh, arthur compton ricket or for a simplified version there is one by the head of the department of university hyderabad pramod k nair dr pramod uh, there is a book called history of english literature so going through that would give you an idea of the british literature its uh, landmarks the historical scenarios and so on and so forth so that will help you appreciate your learnings better another suggestion that i have is reading glossaries not only the glossary of mh abrahams but there are bedford glossaries there is routledge editions cambridge companion and so on so you can go buy that or download that and read that so that you get through the critical terms in english literature another book that i would require uh, that i would recommend to you is especially if you are preparing for ugc net so that's where the danger is if you skip british literature in the second year then cracking ugc net would be really difficult because it it is completely based or or majorly based on the british literature part so that's a risk that you would be running at so one book that i would recommend to you is paul poplowski's uh i don't remember the name exactly right now but i think it's english literature in context or something similar to that the cover of the book would be blue red or green don't get confused they are different editions but the same book so english literature in context by paul poplowski is a book that i would recommend to you which would help you understand these concepts better it has timelines and pictures and maps and chronological events summary of various books uh, crucial works so that would help you crack net another book is edward albert's history of english literature arthur compton ricket has a name as a book by the same name then you have uh, pramod k nayar's book Uh, you have B R Prasad's a background to the study of literature, which would help you understand M E G one. If you choose that paper, understanding what a sonnet is, what an epic is, what a lyric is, what are the uh, poetic functions, what is uh, an agnosis, peripetia, the book called a background to the study of literature. By B Prasad. would be immensely helpful to you so if this be the last session is there any other doubts that you want to clarify assuming that we don't meet again though this world is such a small small world and we can meet as many times as we want you if you are working somewhere you can easily invite me for a lecture there and share the links with your friends and we can easily discuss some other topics there are quite a lot of interesting things theater of the absurd shakespearean theater or uh, uh, current trends in literature research or job opportunities we can discuss anything under the sky so facilitate me somewhere and then we can uh, meet again online offline whichever way you want and we can continue this association i do get a lot of calls from my students to various institutions that they work i have been to various parts of india thanks to my students from ignu because they invite me for lectures for their students in school colleges uh generally about research career opportunities or theater and so on and so forth so yeah any other queries or else we'll say good night for today